So, so we've just gone through the context and the introduction, jumping into a panel discussion and a Q&A at the end. A little bit about Symphony 3. Most of you on the call will probably know of us. Um, Symphony 3, a rapidly expanding SaaS company, very much dedicated to local government services. Uh, three elements to what we do, digital enablement, which is all about uh, helping councils to get up and running with portals, forms, portals, executive dashboards, full websites. Uh, we then have our smart glue, which is all about integration tool sets that allow councils to connect in their, their 40 or 50 systems together to get true automation and optimization. And alongside that, we have an advisory business. And this... Um, where we help councils navigate uh, digital transformation and everything that comes with that. And of course, this series is really about exploring some of the topics around uh, digital transformation. Simple terms, we want to help you guys uh, let your residents get online 24 seven and access services easily and conveniently, and also empower your staff to deliver services with, with great tools. Selection of our clients there, working across Australia uh, and into New Zealand at this stage. So if you're interested in learning more, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Jumping into the series itself, uh, th this is the 11th web webinar that we've run. We run it around uh, our digital maturity framework. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but you'll see that there's kind of six areas down the bottom. We believe each of those areas is related to digital transformation, part of the jigsaw puzzle, if it were, or as it were. Um, today is all about trends and uh, the future, which is down in the bottom corner there. And we've obviously got a wonderful panel to help us navigate that and, and tell us a little bit about it and what they see is, is going to happen in the future. Before I kick off the session, I just want to dedicate this uh, session to a wonderful man, a gentleman called Stephen Dowling, who actually helped us set up these uh, Connected Citizen webinars. Uh, Stephen passed away very unexpectedly uh, about two weeks ago. Um, Stephen, we're in your thoughts, or you're in our thoughts and your family. We're thinking of your family. Today, would have, you would have loved today because it's around disruptive technologies. Uh, so this is dedicated to you. We're thinking of you. So Stephen had a whole uh, webinar that he did with us around change management and unlearning. And the message or the core message was is that you kind of have to let go of the past and what you know to be true to unlock the potential of the future and open your mind to thinking. So that's what I'm encouraging everybody to do today. Um, so without further ado, let me welcome our panelists. Ashay Prabhu, Shaker Vanka, John Nevins, and Michael Fagan. Uh, everyone's probably read your bios, but John, I might get you to kick us off with a 30-second introduction to yourself. Oh, hi, Fergal. Good afternoon, everyone. John Nevins. I had uh, about 25 years in local government before entering semi-retirement a couple of years ago. Ashay, over to you. Hi, my name is Ashay. I'm um, very passionate about local government and strategic asset management. Uh, worked with over 300 governments across Australian landscape and also in the United States and Canada. Really looking forward to this discussion today. Michael? Thanks for the uh, opportunity to uh, talk and, and share some thoughts. Uh, I spent about 17 years in West Farmers, mostly in the Kmart group in a variety of executive roles where I was the chief technology officer when I left. Uh, and then I joined Village Roadshow, which went from public ownership to private equity ownership. And I spent the last few years helping them completely transform their, their service offerings. Wonderful. And last but not least, <laughs> Shaker. Um, thanks, Virgil. Um, I recently joined um, Symphony 3 as a CTO. Um, I got like 19 years of experience in delivering software solutions. And last 13 years, I'm building solutions um, around asset management space. And it is used by local government and utility companies around the globe. Great. Thanks, Jaker. And look, thanks, everybody, for joining us. And um, really honored to have you all here today. So. 
Let's kick off, John. I'm going to throw the first question at you. You know, you've been around local government as a CEO for, I won't say 25 years, but it must be close to, John. Um, you look at the local government landscape. What are the challenges and opportunities that you you see ahead for local government? And, and where do you think technology is, is most needed? Okay. Well, when it comes to local government, there's no shortage of challenges for everyone working in that space. But there are three areas in particular, I think, that stand out. Um, the first is uh, in the context of the technology we're going to talk about, disruptors we're going to talk about today. The first is customer service. Um, the opportunities that technology uh, present in terms of managing the complexity of local government requests, complaints, information inquiries, lodgement of applications, you know, the planning applications, applications under the Health Act, maternal and child health care applications, crossing permits, et cetera, et cetera. The next area is the significant onus that is now placed on local governments when it comes to community engagement under the Local Government Act 2020. Um, things like the community vision, the financial plan, asset plans that councils need to develop that have to have a 10 year scope and have to be undertaken in accordance with council's deliberative uh, community engagement policies. In addition to that, the consultation requirements on the council plan, rating and revenue plans, annual budgets. There's a significant amount of work and coordination involved and the objective there is to actually get engagement with an input from your from council's local community so i think technology presents opportunities there and then asset management just the complexities of asset management when it comes to initiating works orders raising purchase orders checking on the status, closing it down at, at the completion, notifying the customer or the citizen, if you like to give the, the resident that term, on the status of their complaint or their inquiry, getting that across, you know, your, your financial systems, your asset management systems. It's involved, it's complex. Uh, there are always opportunities to improve those efficiencies. And right now, local government, is there's it faces pressures to continually improve efficiencies and not the least of those pressures is the rate cap which all councils are subject to which is less than the actual cost indexes that uh, local government operate in so there's a constant pressure on councils to be doing more with less and i think technology uh, represents an, an opportunity to drive efficiency gains and to be more responsive um, and increase productivity. Great. Thank you, John. That's wonderful uh, setting the scene for us. Look, Asha, I might hand over to you now with your, um, you know, John's talking about the opportunity for optimization and efficiencies. I know you travel the globe talking to local government. Um, so what do you see through your asset management lens and all, the, all these uh, governments you talk to around the world? Thanks, Fergal. Um, local governments around the world, I think, um, like John just explained, the, the fundamental complexities are the same. Uh, but I think where we've come to in the last 10 years is establishing the basis for those um, actions to be undertaken, whether it's customer requests or strategic asset management planning or developing a 10-year capital plan developing a 25-year asset management plan. Um, the, the legislations are different in different states. The requirements are different in different countries. But at the end of the day, every local government is in the game of providing services. And what the community is now requiring is that the government produces its long-term asset management pl plan in line with those expectations. And, and what, what we're finding, uh, Fergal, is um, as local government advances, we're finding that the tasks that used to take, for example, eight months before in relation to collecting the data that is required to produce the budgets can now be done in eight days. The, the, the task of producing a 10-year asset management plan, which was 200 pages long, 
is, is now delivered within minutes once the technology platforms are in place. And, and I mean literally minutes. It's a, it's a print button methodology. Um, and what we have to do as practitioners and thought leaders is take the local government landscape into an era where we are not lagging and we are not delayed by, by data redundancies or, um, or delays in acquiring the data, uh, but we're actually leading by predicting events before they happen. Uh, a long-term financial plan that provides the community with scenarios for the future. Not just what would happen if we raise rates or drop rates or raise taxes or drop taxes, what can we give you better or less, but more around the fact that 70% of your infrastructure, which you're going to use, is still not built. And how do we bring climate and risk uh, connectivity uh, and all of these items into play? Uh, and yes, yeah, you can go to that slide, for example, oh, yeah. <laughs> where, where, where you, you provide a connected platform to local government to say, it doesn't matter where your data is held. It can be in your GIS spatial layer. It can be coming from customer requests in terms of subjective information. It can be coming from the Bureau of Meteorology or from CSIRO. It can be coming from the enormous database and, and intellectual property that is sitting in the ESRI information layers. It's about bringing those pieces together and then, and then delivering a long-term financial plan that balances those outcomes. And I think that's where the shift is coming. It's about saying what used to take us eight months, let's now, let's now deliver that in eight days or eight minutes and, and become uh, leaders in predicting as opposed to lagging uh, because we're using data that's six months old or 12 months old. I think that's the future. And if you just quickly go to the next slide, um, next few slides. It's about saying to the community in terms of deliberative engagement, it's about saying to the elected members in terms of their custodianship, if this is what your portfolio looks like now from the connected dots perspective, that the level of service looks reasonable, or this is what you want to be able to deliver in the future where everything is green, that comes at a cost of $137 per year in rates. But if we go to the next slide, and we say we've only got $65 in the budget per rate payer per year, then we've got to trade off and work out what options can we deliver with that outcome. Or the following slide where, again, the city is able to provide its rate payers with a really small uh, rate base or, 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 or tax increase, but the level of service from a climate perspective, from a retreat perspective, from a risk perspective, uh, is significantly more catastrophic. And unless we provide these options, the long-term asset management plan is, 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 is flawed, it's fictitious, and in, it's our job now as practitioners and technologists to be able to bring this data into the hands of the, of the elected members a lot easier than before. I think that's wonderful. I'd like to come back to the to the a question about data that I have for you, certainly. Um, but let's let's move on and let's introduce Michael. I think Michael, you're obviously coming from a vast experience in totally different sectors, retail and entertainment. Um, tell us what you've done and what you've seen in those sectors, what you've been involved in, and then maybe some of the lessons that you see for local government from 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 the industries you've been in. Sure. I mean, I'll try and I'll try and pick um, a couple of uh, relevant examples. But uh, at the moment, I'm coaching a couple of startups and actually sitting on the board of of, uh, of two small uh, small companies. Uh, and a couple of things that I've seen just in the last um, you know, last couple of years is uh, first is around in the healthcare area, so using AI to translate speech to speech into text. So a doctor's consulting with a patient. It's transcribing the, the the discussion as it's happening. It's then also used listening to what the patient is saying, making suggestions of follow-up questions and potential diagnoses, uh, and allowing more accurate capture of not only the information but also more accurate diagnosis. Uh, it also allows the uh, allows the doctor to get through more patients. So I think I remember the last time last time I went to the doctor, he spent his 
his entire time just looking at a screen, not that you know, and typing while he while he was asking me questions. So AI is making uh, is making making that um, uh, making that um, doctor patient experience. It's faster, it's more accurate, and less likely to have um, you know, have issues. Uh, the second uh, example I give, I've got, I'm coaching a business called Quitch, which is founded out of Swinburne University as a, a female founder. And she's working with a local government in uh, Queensland to help educate their citizen, citizenry, uh, specifically around cyber security and, and anti-phishing. So there's obviously been a, a number of scams that have gone through the, the populist area. I'm not sure where they've been. Uh, uh, scammed by somebody pretending to be the council and getting people to pay rates to the to the wrong bank account, but uh, certainly that's a it's a it's a hot topic. So using uh, a gamified learning experience that the council is paying for and giving to all of their their citizens for for free. Uh, something else that we did um, at Village was we uh, you think with the IT help desk that you that you call up or, or nowadays you're probably more likely to fill in a form or, or write in or send in an email. Uh, we were using ChatGPT to parse those those problems and questions to make a suggestion a suggested answer and to uh, have that available for the IT guy to take a look at not only the the question but actually the potential solution for it. And that remains hidden, so we get the the IT guard to take a look at the suggestion, make sure it's it's uh, it's uh, it's okay, or does it, does it need augmentation, or is it complete rubbish and you can dismiss it? Uh, he, he could just, he then in the best uh, best case scenario, he just needs to look at it, read the question, say yeah, that's the right answer, and and click a button that unhides, uh, sends it back. Uh, when when ChatGPT was new, we weren't actually exactly sure how we would integrate this into you know service now, which was our help desk. Uh, platform. We actually asked ChatGPT to write the code to integrate ChatGPT into into our system, which was uh, which, which is pretty slick. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't know whether Fergus, you've got that that Kmart example that, that on a on a yeah. slide. We we were using machine learning and um, artificial intelligence to build a, a semantic engine to see what the the populace is saying online about a particular topic. In this case, it was. Um, uh, it was around online orders, and I think it was for uh, uh, dress sizes. So, particularly, so how do, how do we ensure that we have um, you know, sending the right the right color, the right size dress to different parts of the of the country, and also to read feedback from Facebook, from re Google reviews, from emails that came in, see what people are are, are saying about it, and it was around. Uh, and then we can see where there's you know, there positive sentiment, negative sentiment, sent, uh, sentiments, and, and group them into, into major themes. So this is something that uh, any local government or local council could do with their feedback systems, is just to, instead of having a, a human being try to do this, have the, have the AI do this, and, and they'll do this in, you know, in a matter of seconds or, or minutes, and then a human being can go and, uh, uh, go and check that. And then the, the last thing I'm uh, doing, so everybody might probably assume is familiar with Transurban. They own Eastlink and a number of toll roads here, but they also own uh, toll roads in the US. And they have a, a dedicated lane on, on their roads in the, in the US. And they use surge pricing to maintain uh, uh, you know, a minimum speed of, of more than, I think it was 120 kilometers an hour. So you think you know, during, during the week, probably not going to be that, that useful, but at five o'clock on a Friday, when you're trying to get to the airport or get out, go on holidays, or, or just before Christmas, then uh, people are more, much more willing to, to pay that. So during COVID, the the price to use that road dropped to five cents. That was the cheapest it's it's been. Uh, but during a peak time, which was just before Christmas, the price to use that road was surged up to one hundred dollars. And every single car now that's manufactured comes OEM Wi-Fi enabled, which basically means the you can actually communicate with the car. So if you're traveling out to the airport and you've got that, those little linked um, uh, link box that, that uh, automatically deducts the toll, but basically you, your car already has that built into it now. So it, if you think about that, then what that does then is actually change what's what's the definition of a toll road, what roads could be toll roads, uh, and how do we uh, you know how do we how do we how do we think about that? So there's probably you know, options in there for parking. You know? So I'm, Already, my local council. I live in the Bayside Council, and uh, they don't send me out a parking sticker anymore. I could just go and park down the beach, and they're they're using uh, license plate recognition to 
figure out whether I should be allowed to, to, to do there or not. I'll probably talk quite a bit for it. I've got a couple of tips, or do you want me to hold them back for later? Oh, we'll hold them on. I'm, I'm, I'm mindful poor old Shaker hasn't had a chance to speak yet, so I will come back to that. I like the notion of surge pricing and business models, and I'm talking about that as well. But, uh, Shaker, we might go to you uh, to let you have your give us your, your five-minute spiel. And, um, you know, you've been developing software solutions for the public sector and local government for, for, for a long time. What have you observed, I suppose, over the last 15 years in terms of the changes and what's ahead in your mind? Yeah, I think the, um, f from my observation, the data is growing and it is um, the data is growing and everything is coming to one place. Like 15 years ago, we used to convince people to move from Excel, using Excel to desktop and from desktop to web apps and web apps to SaaS applications. And now everything is there in the SaaS applications and now people are building AI enabled SaaS applications. So for example, if you feed all your data, which is in, in the text format or in database or in PDFs to an AI chatbot, AI chatbots can do a lot of um, support work uh, answering basic questions. So this type of trend, I can see it is going um, in many industries, not um, not only in the local government space, but in the other space. So that is uh, one area to, to have a look. And also um, because of the IoT industry is evolving a lot at this um, um, same time. And we are getting a lot of data from the IoTs um, 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 in the in the machines and the in the vehicles so based on this iot data also we can we can create all this predictive maintenance um, um, based on the previous historical data i think these are the two things which will be evolving more in the local government space right wonderful thank, thank you shaker i think we've one question come through so let me just deal with that before i and, and ask it of, of you guys uh, from G. Babescu on AI and health. This is must be for you, Michael. Are we making doctors too reliant to technology, which could potentially lead to misdiagnosis? And I guess that AI can be brought to anything, anything that ha involves professional decisions. So you know, you think of planning applications. You think of maternal health nurses in 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 local government. Um, is there a danger we become too reliant on the technology? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I think it's a good question. But I think what we see over and over again, yeah, we're, we're properly trained models uh, that the AI actually becomes better, yeah, so and better than humans are performing that task. So you know, so AI, they're better, they're better drivers. So you know, autonomous self-driving vehicles have less crashes. I think it's you know, human beings are sixteen times more likely to to crash. Now, pretty much every airplane nowadays, it's actually, if you turned off the AI that's in, you know, a, a 747 or an Airbus that comes out now, a human being wouldn't be able to actually fly that on, on its own. In fact, the, the planes that we fly on are, are capable of autonomous flight. We just, um, regulators don't like planes flying without, without human beings at the, at the cockpit. So, um, in the healthcare space, I think it's, it's there as an aid, particularly initially, um, to help the doctor and it's as a productivity aid for the for the doctor uh but over time you know with the questions are if the right questions are being asked and then being captured then i think we'll see that uh, the ai will probably become more accurate at diagnosing yeah. than than doctors are in fact we've already we're already able to you know diagnose and treat diseases that were you know, previously you know untreatable with with, with drugs and, and medication in, in the past with the uh, you know, TPD and and and, and mRNA um, uh, treatments that uh, yeah, 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 that we have. So, so I think is it is it are there going, are there going to be issues? Almost definitely. But uh, are there issues today? I'd say you know almost definitely. It's probably yeah. it'll become safer. I think rather than less safe uh, over time. Uh, I think you know the, the the line that's bandied out about AI is uh, you got to remember that it's never ever going to be any worse than it is today. Mm -hmm. It's only getting better. You know. Yeah, I don't know. I said you or Shaker, do you have a thought on that comment? Or I think I think the important thing to recognize is that AI will reduce human intervention, not remove it. 
um, and it's about uh, providing information in a format that humans can then make wisdom-based decisions. Uh, at the moment, we have a number of information layers that are still very human-centric. Um, so whether it's AI that detects uh, a fault in a machine uh, or whether it's a drone that captures some data and then uses an AI engine to convert it into a, um, uh, a, a catastrophic red or a, or a ticking away orange, uh, or yeah. whether it's AI in the optimization engine of the enterprise system that, that takes billions of data points like on that screen yeah. uh, and brings brings uh, climate and, and the health of the assets and the, uh, and the risk of the assets uh, and then produces a 10-year financial plan that balances the budget. That, that's the work of AI. But humans have to have the wisdom to say, scenario three doesn't look right to me because it may not be palatable with my community. Yeah. Or, or even if I funded scenario one in my long-term financial plan, I might not be able to pragmatically get contractors to deliver that work. So the human wisdom has to, has to come into play. But I think where this helps is reducing that time by 400, 800% compared to previous manually driven processes. Yeah. I will add on, on, onto the, um, onto the Asha's point. Uh, I think many people are saying that um, AI is taking over the jobs, but it's not. It is only uh, taking over um, in four Ds, I will call. Um, so any human being uh, who is doing this dull, dirty, dangerous, and difficult work, AI will take over um, that area. And as as Ashay said, getting up um, all these data points, like many data points, and starting doing this analyzing, it is a little, a little, a little bit of a difficult work. So AI will definitely will take over that piece of work, and humans will be there to uh, to to monitor um, that piece of work. Uh, I was going to take this in a certain direction, but I've got questions coming through. So I'm going to um, I'm going to start asking you the questions that the audience are interested in, if that's OK. Uh, Shaker, you touched on convergence, actually, when you were first speaking, to, like this convergence of IoT data, predictive analytics. That's something I wouldn't mind exploring a little bit more. Data obviously comes in here, and we do have a question on, or a comment and a question. So data is a new oil. When data is scattered into many systems in local government, which we all know about, how do we overcome the challenge of bringing the data together and getting past the red tape? Yeah, so there is always um, a um, people uh, who, are, who are filtering this data. Um, they call the... Um, we call in the in the software industry we call them as a data engineers and data scientists so there is a role evolving and these are the people who are doing a lot of filtering and and, and enhancing the data so if you want to do that th this type of work yes you definitely need to hire a um, data engineer and a data scientist michael you got a comment on that or Ashe, any thoughts mm -hmm. I'll let, I'll let Michael go first. I do have a thought. <laughs> Thanks, Ashay. I mean, I think in, in that specific one, um, I mean, I'm, I'm one of the people who stood up on stage five years ago, said, you know, data is the new oil. We're, we're trying to gather as much as possible. Um, I spoke at a marketing, the Australian uh, marketing conference earlier this year and said, you know, data is probably the new poison for, for organizations uh, because we're, we're trying to not hold um, that holds uh, personally identifiable information you know, as much mm. as possible. People know what the, what's happening with Optus and, and Medicare. So uh, but leave, leaving that aside, we do have, we do have a lot of data, uh, you know, but the likes of the large language models, so I think somebody like uh, ChatGPT is probably the most famous, but there's also Lambda from Google. There's um, Hugging Face has um, Roberta. There's there's a whole bunch of them, uh, uh, and Amazon has has Claude. So there's a whole bunch of large language models there, and the the, the key part of it is that is the natural language um, uh, part of that. So using you can set up a 
you know, for a local government area, I'd say you could, you know, with your data, you could set up a, like a protected small uh, version of, of ChatGPT that works on just your data. Uh, and, uh, let the AI do the work, yeah? So, so they, that, you know, how long is it gonna take for you to review all the data you have? It's gonna take you, you know, days, months, probably years. You know, but, but this is something that the AI can, can do in the background and they can do it overnight and they're not gonna ask for a break. So this is exactly what, what AI is used for. So using a large language model then to trawl through your data and then, be a, then for you to be able to interrogate that data using a natural language uh, prompt, I think is something that is um, uh, something that you, you should be thinking about or could be thinking about. You know, and I'd use that to address the, you know, the other question that came in around, well, what can I, I'm an LGA, but I've got no budget and no money and I've, I've limited expertise. Yeah. Well, you know, the, I'd use the, the guys from Symphony 3 or, or, you know, ask them to come in and help to try and get something like that set up. But that, that'd be an area that I would go and focus on. I mean, you shouldn't be worried about people paying rates by, by Bitcoin. Uh, that's not something that's going to have a large impact. I'd be going and starting with something that's a bit more, you know, simple and relevant and that will have an impact on the average, you know, citizen. Very common. Yeah. Asha, I'll throw it over to you. Yeah, just just a really simple example, right? And and this is a, uh, if I can have everyone's attention on this particular particular scope. An average local government anywhere in the world has got an infrastructure stock of a billion dollars, and that's a that's a researched figure, which means if if the local government's assets were to be wiped off tonight it would cost a billion dollars to replace them. And that billion dollars for an average council, some councils like City of Melbourne might be 35 billion uh, and, and the Shire of Corowa in New South Wales, for example, might only be 500 million, but a billion is about the average. And that billion dollars is getting eaten up or consumed financially at about 15 to $20 million per year. Now, if you flick to that next slide, please, Fergal, the opportunity here for local government is to say, how do I how do I cut that rate of consumption across those 500,000 assets that are in various stages of their life cycle? How do I cut that down from 20 million a year to 15 million a year without spending more money? And for humans to sit in a room and work that out over a 20 year period would probably take 35 years by the time you work through all the billion permutations. And this is where AI comes in with scenario modeling platforms to reduce that time from that, that, that hypothetical 35 years to do the work down to about three minutes. But that's wisdom. And wisdom is then applied to say, which of the scenarios do I pick which are palatable with the community? Then think of AI, not just in analyzing the data, which can be done within seconds or minutes. But now think about AI where the data is being fed to me literally live through an IoT, yeah. through a bot, uh, through, through products like NearMap, uh, which take aerial photography, uh, or through, the, through clever use of satellite imagery, uh, which means a local government inspector may never have to leave his, his control room because he's getting live feeds on anything that can be seen by a spatial tool or a satellite or an, or an IoT device. Uh, imagine a situation where a train leaves uh, Spencer Street Station or Sydney Station and arrives in Wollongong, and by the time it arrives there, the AI has detected a fault in one of the equipment and there is a contractor waiting there with a work order. And these are the possibilities that are happening right now in terms of supply chain and logistics that is unlocking millions and millions of dollars without doing anything fancy. And it's the same with climate data. Why would we not utilize scenarios like you see there where 70% of the infrastructure we are yet to build will be built at locations that are climate resilient or built with, with asset treatments that are climate resilient that can absorb heat or not reflect heat, for example, or, or facades of facilities that are retaining the, the temperature as opposed to emitting the temperature. 
or putting cool seals down on pavements uh, in order to not have reflective uh, heat rise. All of these are elements that are at our fingertips. Uh, and our job as practitioners is to join these dots so we can put, put that wisdom in front of elected members. So I think we're not that far from solving it, but I come back to that point that at the end of the day, it's reducing human intervention by 800% in some cases, but the humans are still required to make the wisdom decisions as to which scenarios to pick. Yeah, great point. I'll keep going on uh, questions. I'm going to come back to the question on uh, personnel and budget and those type of things, but uh, uh, we've got Sarah from Activate Consulting. Uh, hi, Sarah. I know your uh, your business is all around community engagement. Um, you've got a great question in here about in a climate of low and declining community trust in government and a lot of people's fear of AI, what opportunities do you think uh, new technologies provide to rebuild trust and re-engage communities in decision making? Uh, I think, Michael, you probably touched on it a little bit, maybe with your example from uh, Kmart, but do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think the first thing to say is that you, know, you, don't, you don't, don't believe that AI is magic. Yeah? So if you've got a Roomba at home, then you've got a robot going around cleaning your home that is you know, probably as sophisticated as what Amazon have in, in their warehouse. In fact, yours is probably more sophisticated because it's a more sophisticated environment where the, the warehouse has actually been, been, been laid out specifically you know and you've got cats and dogs and, and chairs running around you know, not running around your home but take the cats and dogs are so it, it's not magic uh, and it's been around for a long time so anybody's got if you've got a smartphone you've been you've been using ai for uh, for some time so again if you think about the the capture um you know security device if you log into a website it used to be all about words now it's all about pictures so if you think about those pictures, they're all related to traffic. So it's identify the traffic light, identify a bicycle, identify a pedestrian uh, in this photograph. And what's, what's happening there is that Google is using you to train its AI. And that's been happening now for, for 10 years. So you know, go, out, go ask Google for a check for all the, the work that you've done for them. Uh, so I think there's, there's, it's, it's, it's been around for a while and it's not, go, it's not going to go away. Yeah, it's not like the the metaverse kind of came and came and went, but but AI and in particular generative AI is going to you know be here for a for a very long time. Uh, so one, we need to embrace it. I think the the next thing is around you know having having a policy, having a position, and then a policy, and then an implementation plan around responsible AI and uh, data data ethics. Yeah, so. This would be one of the things that we, we kind of grappled with at, at Kmart. So given that we are part of that West Farmers ecosystem, uh, you know, and being part of Flybys, every time you scan the Flybys card, you, you add a little bit more information to your profile. So, uh, you know, we would know that if, uh, you know, if you went into office works after shopping for baby clothes in, uh, in Kmart, we know that you might have children or you might be pregnant or you might have, you know, school age kids and therefore you could sell a, a release a back to school offer. Uh, we decided not to do that because it was just too creepy. Yeah, people because we had to, we, you know, poll our customers said, yeah, we kind of would find it that would be a little bit weird if you, if you knew that I was pregnant yeah, and I hadn't told anybody, but because I bought a pregnancy test you know, over here that, that you, you knew that. So, so we didn't uh, we didn't implement that, uh, and we also went through a, a whole consent uh, framework uh, uh, and governance process, where we and we did this again then at villages of of asking people for their permission. Hey, here's what we'd like to do, you know, uh, with your data, or here's what we will do with your data. We're asking for your permission, and here's the information that we will send you and how we will we will use that. And if you're willing to give something up to give something back to people, then they, they are you know willing to to give you their data and the permission to use that data. So, you know, free chalk tops and free popcorn, uh, you know, was a was a great incentive at, at village. Uh, but uh, if anybody, I've got teenage kids, and if anybody's got teenage kids, you know, who knows what information these guys are giving out you know, already for free, and and to whom they're giving that out. So, I think for local government areas, having that having that consent, having a uh, a position for ethical AI, a position for how you're going to govern data, a policy on how you're going to do that, and then actually executing that in, in accordance with those, those policies, I think is going to help drive that, that trust back. Right. Shaker, any thoughts on that? Pretty much he covered 
most of the part. Good. Uh, John, I've, you've been very quiet here, and I know you're uh, you're not a technologist necessarily, but any thoughts from you? As we're kind of 40 minutes into the session. Just the, the pace of change, Fergal. The, uh, I've been out of uh, full-time employment local government for a couple of years now, and um, when I was uh, working full-time in local government, when it came to asset management, the relevant reference points were the, you know, in Victoria, were the, it was the MAV step program. And then we moved on to local government management as asset assessment frameworks. And nowhere in, and they were the state of the art, they were the, the benchmarks against which yep. councils were assessed in Victoria. AI wasn't part of the conversation. The opportunities that AI now presents in terms of that data analysis put in the context of councils needing to produce 10-year asset management plans to have rating and 10-year rating and revenue plans. So much has changed and it's that pace of change. And your initial question to me at the start of this session were, you know, what do you see as the challenges? The one I didn't mention was staying on top of the technology change because that provides the greatest opportunity. But it's resource hungry, and it's that's another challenge for local government. So being so able to we... look out and see, you know, no one in a council is going to be an expert in all that's going on, but it's being aware of where are the opportunities, where are the reference points, who can councils approach, how do you leverage that external knowledge, and how do you do it cost effectively because of the pressure that councils are under. But the opportunities are enormous, and it moves quickly. I'm interested in exploring that a little bit because, you know, Michael made a point about, well, outsource it. We've got councils now moving everything to the cloud, as it were, in, in increasing numbers. To me, uh, maybe one of the areas that councils can be better at is the the wisdom as Ashe, the wisdom to make technological decisions maybe isn't, I don't know if that's in local government, uh, it's probably in some local governments, but as an industry as a whole, how do we build that expertise or how do you how do you employ that expertise or how do you gar gain that expertise, I suppose? I'd, I'd frame it differently. The, I think there's an enormous amount of expertise inside local government. It's yeah. the challenge now and... Is, is it's the it's the volume of data, it's the complexity of it. And as Ashay and Shaker have, have, ref, have commented earlier, it's it's the lead times in processing it's processing it, it's the resources involved in doing it. So it's how do you complement that in-house expertise in local government? How do you leverage that? And I think that's the opportunity. And as I said a moment ago, what was relevant prevalent and all the reference points a couple of years ago in asset management, the STEP program, you know, the, the Victorian AG had come along and look at your perform and the lead indicators that the Office of Local Government had in Victoria around how well you were doing in terms of, you know, what uh, the asset management frameworks that were in place and you were, you were, rep you were checked against. AI wasn't part of it. Whereas if you're doing it today, if you didn't have AI in it, yeah, you're taking the long road round, and you're only going to scratch the surface. Yeah, uh, Fergal, if I can add to John's comments there, of course because you can. I, yeah. I was I rolling know. a grenade there, by the way, John. You very diplomatically answered it, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, F Fergal, if I can add to John's comment because John's got that wisdom in local government. And there's a couple of comments on the panel as well about federal yep. and state government should have the expertise to assist local government in providing options. And there is also a comment here from Sarah to say, what skills and attributes are becoming more critical for to, to ingest these sorts of things? Uh, and who in local government should be responsible for it? Uh, can, can I make a, a case in point here, which is, um, uh, it, it's, it, it might come as a surprise, but these are some facts. 70% of the world's infrastructure is actually with local government. Um, yeah. Every human being in the world 
is a customer of some local government somewhere. So we have a vested interest. Compared to any other service provider, it's local government that is fundamentally uh, touching the lives of literally every individual in the world. And the, the level of skill and expertise in local government is underestimated, in my opinion. Uh, some of the practices I have seen where uh, integration of systems to unlock uh, insights into the data. Uh, some of the um, uh, work I've seen where um, advancement in technology uh, with drones and, and spider cams to, to uh, determine uh, risk-based issues within facilities, pipes, etc., excel in local government, absolutely excel in local government. Uh, the regulations around strategic asset management are local government driven to the point where in Australia it is so advanced that the United States and the UK now looks to the Australian local government as a thought leader uh, in this space. So I think I think people, uh, skills and the appetite is there in local government, uh, but it's up to local government now. And this is this is my 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 prayer is. Um, is that when local government is buying technology, uh, don't just buy technology that is traditional in nature. Um, ask, the, ask the provider to give you examples of how um, something that takes the local government four months to produce is now gonna take four days. Or, uh, or data that the local government has that is coming from so many different sources that the provider can actually ingest and provide wisdom all the way from the boardroom to the back room, all the way from the council chambers through to the to the depot staff and the maintenance operators that, that patch our potholes. How do you do that? Ask those questions and you will find that there are providers that are able to provide that technology at a significantly lower cost than we would have ever imagined because we're almost there. Brilliant. That's uh, absolutely a wonderful statement, Ashe. Well, um, I'll keep it going. So Sarah has another. Actually, we'll go with Lorraine's question or statement. Digital doesn't stop at physical LGA borders. How can we enable better service for the citizen through collaborations and service and data sharing? Digital twins, Ashe, does this come into that thinking? Uh, you know, Michael, any thoughts, Shaker? Yeah, sorry, I'm just reading the question. Yeah, sorry, if Sheka and Michael, you can go ahead if you want. Otherwise, yeah, I can comment comment as well. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give it. A, I'll give it a, a couple of things I said earlier on were, were facts. Uh, yeah, this is an opinion. Okay, so it's, so you know, take take with a grain of salt. Um, yeah, and I'm using the examples from you know from the business world. <clears throat> it's much easier to you know, deliver a better service <laughs> initially within when you have control of everything. Yeah? Now, you get a much better outcome longer term if you can deliver the service across multiple domains or multiple multiple LGAs. But I'd say, you know, if you, before you actually start thinking about, you know, how do you, how do you, you know, optimize and, and integrate with other local government areas, is clean up your own backyard first would be, would be my advice. Yeah, and when you've got something, something good there, then you can look at, look at going and, and sharing it. So, Again, you know, digital driver's license is a good example of that, which is, I know it's not a local, it's a local issue, but you know, New South Wales were first with that. And you can say, well, what happens? I go from Albury, Albury into Wodonga or Wodonga into Albury then. You know, that, if you have that question, you know, I need to pull out my physical physical license. Yeah, and you did that, you did in the beginning, but you know, now we're working on a, you know, you know national or federal or, or digital licenses that can, that can walk across the, the entire country. So uh, I'd say, and, don't, don't be daunted by you know the, the too big a task. I'd say you know, you know think big. That's where we want to get to. But I'd start small and optimize in your own own area. Figure out how to make it work and then scale fast. Yeah, I might also add to that, Lorraine, that uh, it actually doesn't stop at the LGA borders. And I'm speaking from just uh, without being patronizing to anyone. This is pure grassroots experience with over 350 councils in Australia that there is a lot of collaboration that does happen. For example, there is consensus now on how to assess at the very simplest level, how to assess the physical condition of our roads, buildings, bridges. So there is benchmarking capability. 
there is a lot of collaboration and knowledge sharing by data capture providers that are now able to provide local governments with asset degradation profiles. That was a myth five or 10 years ago because these data providers have been collecting this data on behalf of these local governments for 15, 20 years. So now they've got deep machine learning with 15 years of data across 500 municipalities over the last 20 years. And they hold that they hold that information in terms of providing the local government with the collaborative output. Uh, there is a lot of lot of collaboration that happens in templates, for example. How do we develop a long term asset management plan? How do we optimize our budgets? Um, the Institute of Public Works Engineers, for example, has done a lot of practice notes in each of the infrastructure areas that is now consistently used by local governments here and now is also being uh, used by uh, the Government Finance Officers Association, uh, which is the body for the 30,000 municipalities in the US uh, and, and Ditto in Canada. So I think that that sharing is happening, but where we are lacking is is the the sharing of the uh, the subjective information. For example, how does the cust how does the customer feel about the service? How do we convert some of that CRM data into objective information? Uh, does it matter what sort of transportation we provide? Does it matter if you are a university student compared to say a mother with a pram? Or a, or a visitor to the city or a, or a tourist. How does that customer perception come into play? I think that's where local governments really need to collaborate a lot more. So those um, those data driven points in terms of financial decision making is ultimately connected to how the customer feels about that service. And that I think is is happening as we speak because more and more of these conversations are happening in local government. I think that's right. And I show for you that giving ourselves a plug in terms of collaboration, we've got clients who share our templates, share our forms, share yeah. integration connectors, you know, cut, cuts costs, cuts training costs, increases <laughs> learning across the sector, all those things are really important yeah. in, um, in a constrained environment. I knew this would happen, that we would run out of time. I think we're on 51 minutes or 52 minutes. Um, <laughs> So what I might do is put it across to you guys, three tips um, around, uh, you know, preparing for the future and disruptive technologies. What would your three tips be to uh, your local council? Who wants to tackle that one? I'll go first because I've only got one tip <laughs> when it comes to technology. It's make sure you have an external focus and awareness of what's going on. You don't have to, don't have to be the expert, just got to be aware of the technology that's of the new technology and the technology changes that are occurring and the opportunities that might present. And then where do you go or how do you access that? Great. Thanks, John. Shaker, Ashe, Michael. Um, I have a small tip. Uh, I think um, we we haven't uh, talked anything um, on the cybersecurity space, uh, which is very crucial for the local government. Um, I, I, I've seen um, a lot of um, cybersecurity attacks happening, um, and and um, it's very easy to you know build um, very highly secured apps, highly securely um, secured system, but what it is missing is um, not having our employees um, a proper cybersecurity training. We should have at least a cybersecurity training for each of, each of our employees um, in the organization. So th uh, that is my first tip. And also uh, focus on the people first, um, then the technology. Um, have um, Give them the proper training um, uh, with the emerging um, um, technologies. I know it's hard. But I, I, I think um, this is the way to go. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, that's about my suggestions. Thank you, Shaker. Shaker. My, my tip, Fergal, would be about um, uh, the CIOs and the CFOs and the CEOs um, putting a lot more attention when, when procuring technology is to say to the technology provider, here are the seven bottlenecks I have in my process 
these bottlenecks are material in nature because it it's taking 30 staff eight months to process this information. I would like you to show me how I can do that in eight days. As simple as that. Uh, and I'll give you a really simple example. Last week I was workshopping with a with a very uh, with a small council where there are three people in their accounts department that spend literally four months reconciling invoices at the end of the financial year. And that is prevalent in local government. And I, I would like to see by 2027 that that three months, three people is cut down to half a person who is doing wisdom based analysis and the and the reconciling is done within minutes. Right. Michael. Are you still with us? Sarah from Activate asked a question, typed a question, and I've actually typed an answer, so I don't know whether that's gone to everybody or just okay. back to Sarah, so uh, maybe we could share that one. Uh, and, you know, I think, you know, if I was a CEO of an LGA or, or, or run, running one of them, I think that the three tips I give is, first, one is the first step is the hardest. Right? So you've got, to, you've got to take that first step, which is go and experiment and, and try it. Uh, the second thing is to choose something simple and focus on making a success then so that's a, a big huge impact and that was a mistake we made at Kmart we went for that that big huge impact uh, thing and the most complex use case instead of something simple that was going to actually demonstrate the success and actually demonstrate how the, how the thing worked uh, because there's also going to be a lot of you know naysayers and people you know question whether or not this this thing will actually you know AI is just going to be another fad; it'll be gone in a you know in a couple of months. So, so choosing the right use case and focusing on something that has a, a you know a good business outcome uh, and paying rates for Bitcoin is not one of those things. But I've I've given a couple of examples in in, in that that answer I typed. Yeah. And the the last tip I had, which we we kind of already you know covered off, um, <clears throat> actually, is to keep humans in the loop in the initial stages. Yeah. So reviewing those, uh, reviewing those initial su you know, suggestions. Uh, yeah, you know, Jacob talked about hiring a data engineer or a data scientist. Now they will help build a model, but we need you know regular human beings and business folk to train the model. Now, an example I give of that is uh, we build a very sophisticated forecasting and inventory model. Uh, you know, at Kmart, you know, invested a huge amount of money in about making sure we had the right product and the right colors, the right style, and right sizes all around the country. And the uh, you know. If you think about the you know, the data scientists and the data engineers, you know they did actually look like typical IT guys, big beards, you know, probably sitting at home, spent 20 hours a day on on the PC, and they were mystified that you know our sleepwear peaked in in May. You know, they said there must be something well something wrong with that, and they spent weeks trying to figure it out, but the model kept coming back and saying no, no, so the sales of sleepwear and pajamas peaks in May, and as soon as they mentioned it to one of the um, you know, one of the buying team, they said, well, of course it does. That's when Mother's Day is. So you need you need a you know you need a human being to interpret for the model and provide that that context you know, of, of wisdom as as Ashe called it. Uh, so that'd be the be the third tip I give. Uh, Fergal. Great, thank you, everybody. Uh, I feel as if we're only scratching the surface and we're only really getting started, but we try and hold this to sixty minutes. So I'm going to uh, be diligent and leave people wanting more. Um, final thing I want to do is just thank. Thank you all for, for joining us today. Uh, it's been a wonderful conversation. Uh, I think, you know, we've got some practical examples, but we've also imparted some great wisdom. Um, I'm sure we'll have questions coming through thick and fast. If anyone has any questions afterwards, shoot them through to us. We'll, um, we'll, we'll do some follow up after this. But really, I just want to thank uh, Ashe, Shaker, Michael and John for joining me today and for um, giving up their time and their knowledge and their expertise. So thank you, guys.